So, this is what medicine used to be. Magic invocations of the gods. And here we are, out on the playa, in a, the perfect place to take a neutral eye and look at the culture, the myths, the taboos of our own default world, the same way we might an Amazonian village. Well, one interesting, one interesting cliche that everyone in our world seems to say is that the healthcare system is broken. Well, how do we know about the healthcare system? How do we know about a weather system? I see the wind picking up the dust, and a lot of dust seems to move in the same direction at about the same speed. So I believe that there's probably wind there. I could put an instrument in front of that wind, and it could measure how fast it was moving. I can feel it. What about the healthcare system? If you looked at the world before the 1860s and you asked people about the healthcare system, they would have no idea what you were talking about. They would say, well, there's th these guys and they take out your blood and the bad humors in your blood. And if they do a good job, maybe you get better. And if they do a bad job, maybe you die. And they'd assume that you could look at the humors with the, some sort of an instrument, the same way you could look at the wind, maybe with a microscope or whatever. But actually, there wasn't anything there to see. After the 1860s, Florence Nightingale started to be, build the first thing that we would call a real healthcare system. Rather than just having doctors do what made sense to them, they had records in hospitals where they kept track of what people were doing and compared one treatment to another and figured out what was actually working. When this happened, for the first time, going to a hospital made you more likely rather than less likely to get better. Big deal. However, like all systems, this thing has come to, to an end. When Atul Gawande talks about the healthcare system today in the Checklist Manifesto, he shows how if we were to measure and implement simple, consistent procedures within our hospitals, we could save hundreds of thousands of lives a year. So, how do we know about the healthcare system? One way is by doing a study. By analogy to the wind carrying dust, we would expect a real healthcare system to carry something like lives, to move us towards a longer life expectancy and better mor morbidity outcomes. But when the US government commissioned a study in the 1970s by the Rand Corporation, they gave, they gave a 5,800 person group either free healthcare or 95% off their healthcare or no discount, or 25 or 50% off. After a few years, they were able to see what was happening. The people who were getting more healthcare spent three days a year more in hospitals and doctor's offices. But the only health outcome that seemed to be better systematically was that they were more likely to have prescription glasses. This result would have absolutely astonished me except that I'd already been a Peace Corps volunteer and investigated the healthcare systems of the world. One of the first things that you notice when you do that is that there's no obvious connection between how much you spend on medicine and how long people live. If you look at these three countries, Jordan, the United States, and Libya, you find that Jordan and Libya both spend about $450 a year on healthcare. But Jordan lives a year and a half longer than the United States, and Libya lives seven months shorter. The US, of course, spends $8,300 a year on healthcare to do slightly better than Libya, but a lot worse than Jordan. So if our instruments fail to detect the systematic movement by the wind of healthcare, then we might question whether it's actually there. In addition to the wind moving the dust in a direction, it's full of air molecules that are moving around in all directions and near the speed of sound. They're definitely there, but they're not the wind. I'm inclined to say that the US healthcare system doesn't exist. There's plenty of hot air, 16 to 19% of the GDP worth, but no wind. 
So don't get me wrong, medical science is awesome. The US spends $100 billion a year, that's less per capita, well, that's less per capita than Libya spends on healthcare. And for that, they get half the world's Nobel laureates and tremendous medical advances that, you know, you might have heard of and imagined were in science fiction decades or centuries away, but have actually been done in labs. The thing is, you don't ever hear of them. They never get into the hospitals, into the not minds of doctors, into common practice. So what's an example of this? Well, if anything would get people's attention, you would imagine raising the dead would be it, right? But when scientists tend not to be very good at branding, and when in, in the University of Pennsylvania, they raise the dead, they call it the Center for Resusc Resuscitation Science, and it never makes much headway in the news. People are in fact routinely being brought back after 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes 30 or more, uh, they can kill pigs f and then bring them back half an hour or an hour later. It's just mind-blowing, but we never see it. So a great example, it's not just things doctors haven't heard of that don't enter practice. Every doctor, every neuroscientist, every neurologist, everyone who reads Fa Scientific American has read about the treatment for phantom limb pain, where you are missing a limb, and that limb feels like it's still there and it hurts. And by placing another limb across from it in a mirror, you can get um, relief from that pain permanently in just a few minutes. The URL at the bottom here is from a blog by a psychiatrist who treated a patient successfully using the mirror trick. The funny thing is, every day they saw them for three years, they thought about that scientific experiment, but gave them painkillers, which is the normal customs and taboos of their medical culture. And then finally they thought to use the phantom limb mirror trick and it worked immediately. Previously the patient had been through two other psychiatrists who'd also given them painkillers for a total of 10 years. All of these people knew how to help them. Now it's not just doctors who are screwing up by not telling us how to help ourselves, by not, we don't help ourselves. We don't make the medical interventions that we know that will improve our lives. So. Four to five percent of the U.S. population has uh, clinical depression. And the medical establishment is beginning to use cognitive behavioral therapy, which is evidence-based to alleviate depression. But the simplest method of raising people's self-reported happiness in the long term is just spending two hours over two weeks once writing gratitude letters. Apparently, this has a larger impact on people's happiness years later than anything else we've ever studied. Marriages, divorces, serious injuries. It's absolutely amazing, but practically no one does it, even though I bet a lot of you already know about it. it it's not just gratitude letters. Here we are out on the playa. We know the dust is bad for us, and science says that unlike medicine, environmental cleanup does help our life expectancy. A point, uh, you get a 0.4 to 0.8 year life expectancy gain, about the same as the difference between the US and Libya, for every halving of the density of particulate pollution in the air. Well, we all know how to buy air filters. Once again, we probably don't mostly do it. And while we're protecting our lungs, how about e-cigarettes? Anyone in the audience smoke? I mean, they've had them for about 15 years. And they simulate the experience of smoking pretty well. It, I haven't done any research to show that e-cigarettes are healthier than cigarettes, but it really just stands to reason that they would be. So when I'm really worried, when I don't just say it stands to reason because I think that I might be in trouble, I'd rather check. And an example of this is of what made me re really worried was this Kellogg's Product 19. It's got all the iron I need in just one serving. But wait, don't they leave iron out of men's vitamin pills because it causes heart disease and strokes? Yeah, good idea to have a snack food where you can eat all day and go through 10 or 15 days of RDA of iron. Anyway, so this made me wonder whether I was getting way too much or way too little of some other minerals. 
I decided to commission scientists and spent about $7,000 having people go through the medical literature and look at common diets. And basically, they concluded that there was a major nutrient deficiency in most healthy people's diets. And it's not, the one, it's not one that you might be thinking of. It's salt, or what we call out here, electrolytes. Now, we all get told that salt is bad, but every culture has its theories about evil spirits killing people. We're also told that we need salt to live. And in fact, this world we see around us is actually sodium and potassium crossing across neural membranes. Um, sa salary, the word, used to mean enough salt to stay alive for a day, which was sometimes worth more than gold per pound. Anyway, you're supposed to get about 4.8 grams of sodium salt a day, and about, sorry, of potassium salt a day, and about half as much sodium as potassium. The potassium chloride tastes terrible if you're not used to it, but if you dilute it in a liquid that's high in potassium already, like coconut water, it starts to taste like coconut if you're deficient, and still terrible if you're getting too much. One of these great things about having brains that have been created by evolution to keep us alive is that when it comes to things that were in our natural environment, and salt's been in our environment for about two, three billion years, our brains actually know what they're doing. They're a lot better than mythology. They may not be better than science, but they're definitely a good combination. Anyway, as soon as I started taking enough potassium and sodium, I felt a lot better, gained a lot of uh, water mass, which I think was pretty good. And, um, you know, it's been great. Uh, I, the thing is, my brain told me this was something I should be doing. But I didn't think to do it until someone went through the scientific literature and told me, yep, you're, this is what the scientific literature says. It's not what our culture says, but it's what science says. So if people can be wrong about salt, which we're evolved to know about, which is solid and physical, not invisible and amorphous like God or the healthcare system, if it's something that we can see and touch and that our brain screams out we need, then what else can we be wrong about? My, t my attitude is everything. It seems that the healthcare system isn't broken. If you can't use something, the healthcare system to falsify some null hypothesis, then it doesn't exist. But science does, and it's possible to go through all of that literature that people work so hard to create and find out things for yourself, or trust your brain when you're not that worried. They, they both usually say the same things because they're both, you know, design, systems designed by evolution or by smart people to figure out what's true. Unfortunately, medicine is not. I've brought you the legend of healthcare.